Ooh. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program. We're so glad you're here. Uh, before we begin, um, I'd like to just tell you a little bit about um, AIA Miami's upcoming events. My name is Colleen Stovall. I'm the Director of Programs and Events for AIA Miami and MCAD. Um, we have uh, right now in uh, the Miami Center for Design and for Architecture and Design, we have a great show, uh, which is the best designs of um, 2020, which are the winners of the AIA Miami Design Awards. So come down to downtown Miami and see it. This weekend, we have a wonderful program um, that we're, we're um, collaborating with New Orleans AIA, uh, and it's the Women in Architectures program, and this one's called Revitalize. It's a design and practice exchange, and it's all day Friday, August 27th, and Saturday, August 28th. We have a couple of office crawls coming up, if anyone's inclined, one on September 23rd at AECOM, and one on um, the 26th coming up at Gensler. The Emerging Professional Awards are October 1st um, and at 7 o'clock, and that's in person at the Glass Box at Ironside. We have several events coming up for October, which is the whole month of October, which is um, architecture and design related events. This is one we have organized already. It's a book talk on Cuban modernism, uh, mid-century architecture from 1940 to 1970 on Thursday, October 21st at 6 p.m., which should be very good. It's um, written by Victor Dupy. Dupy and Jean-Francois Lejeune. I think he's from the University of Miami. So come and see that one. And of course, on the 29th of October, we have the AIA Miami Design Awards Carnival Celebration, which is our annual gala and a celebration of the very best designs of 2021. And just to remind you on um, November 18th, uh, this year is Give Miami Day, and if you would like to support um, the Miami Center for Architecture and Design, we'll be sending you lots of information about that. So we'll get on with our program, and right now I'd like to introduce Maria Van Diemen um, at OFS. She's a district sales manager, and she's going to run tonight's program. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining tonight and thank you, Colleen, for kicking it off. Um, there's a lot going on with AIA. So I'm gonna share my screen, screen quickly here. Um, so tonight we're going through JEDI. This is part three of the series. I think a few of you have been involved on the other ones, um, but this is tonight talking about diversity. Um, like Colleen mentioned, I'm Maria Van Diemen. I'm with OFS, a commercial furniture company, and we supply human-centered furniture for commercial spaces um, for workplace, education, hospitality, and healthcare. And I'm on the AIA Diversity and Inclusion Committee. And then I also co-chair the DEI Committee for my own company, OFS. Um, I'm a licensed interior designer and part of IIDA as on their board of directors as well. So to kick it off here, again, thanks for coming. Um, it's important that we start out and really get a common language and common vocabulary when it comes to speaking about these things. Um, this is the third part of the series. And if you missed any of them, they're available on the AIA YouTube page for AIA Miami. So all of the different recordings will be available there for you. Um, but first of all, justice. Justice is removing barriers in order to promote equitable opportunities. And in part one, Vanessa spoke about some of these barriers in our profession. 
and how the history in our company has, or in our country, has created barriers, which we need to acknowledge in order to address and promote equitable opportunities. And last week, um, we spoke about equity is allocating resources to ensure that everyone has the access that they need in order to achieve the same opportunities and outcomes. And Craig so generously talked last week about equity and what that means for us as a profession and some of the things that he and his firm are doing to promote equity at MC Harry. And if you don't know MC Harry, um, they're one of the leading firms in creating equity and diversity within their firm here in Miami. So that brings us to today. Today we're talking about diversity, which is an array of differences, an array of varied experience and perspectives as an advantage to us. And that's what we're focusing on today, um, both diversity in our world, in our workplace, um, and the benefits of diversity but also how we can support and encourage diversity in our workplaces and improve hiring and remove barriers. And then next week, um, Nadine, who chairs the AIA Diversity Inclusion Committee, Nadine will be talking about inclusion to wrap up the series. And inclusion is creating belonging so that all can fully participate. So this is the equation that is so important. Um, and these all go hand in hand, all of these topics, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion. Um, and when justice and equity are put into motion, it can equal an, an outcome that is more diverse and more inclusive. So justice and equity are consciously recognizing that barriers exist and taking action to dismantle them and to help people based on need. Um, and this equitable opportunity can help to build and grow diversity and inclusion, which is what we all want and why we're all here. So removing barriers and providing resources equals that diversity and inclusion. So, here is just an image, and this is a really good graphic um, of just what these terms mean. And we showed these in some of the other, um, in all of the other presentations, but just again, giving a good recap of what all these mean. So diversity, diversity makes us all unique. Um, in this illustration, it's showing people with three different heights. It's an example of diversity. And all three of these people are different, which you can see. Um, but then in the real world context, that's where it becomes important. And here it shows the context of a baseball game and a fence. And you can see that the diversity still exists here, but because it's in context, there's challenges because not everyone has the visibility to see the game, the baseball game here. And this represents the systems of inequality and injustice that make it so that we're not all on the same playing field. And this happens both societally, um, intentional and accidental, and it also trickles into our profession as well. So the tall person here is obviously able to see the game, but he probably can't even see or maybe doesn't even notice that that shorter person is left out or struggling. But just because the tall person can't see the inequity doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Injustice exists here. And there is inequity, but not everyone is living with it or not everyone is experiencing it. So these are three graphics showing um, visually the nuances of each of these terms. So justice is removing barriers. And in this case, the fence is removed so that everyone has access to see the game. And justice um, is deliberately removing these systems and structures which cause the inequality. And equity here is providing resources based on need so that everyone gets an equal opportunity. So the boxes here are stacked so that the three people can all see over the fence. Some people need more individualized help to have an equal opportunity. Um, and with both justice and equity, 
we're seeing the opportunity for outcomes as equal. But equality in itself is not enough because everyone has a different starting point. So there's still the guy who can't see. And Craig gave a really good example last week about um, just discussing these three different topics. And he gave the example of when people come over to your house and you're cooking for family or friends, if you serve everyone the same plate, that's equality. Everyone gets the same plate of food, but then throw in a vegetarian or a vegan or someone who's on keto diet. <laughs> um, that meal that's all of a sudden served is not able to be eaten by some of those people. So as a proper host, you'd want to provide options so that everyone can eat no matter what. So an equitable meal would be making accommodations for that vegetarian or that vegan so that everyone can eat. And it's really simple human decency to make accommodations so that everyone has access. So equality is not the answer, but it's equity that gives everyone what they need to achieve. So that brings us to today. So what is diversity? And it's our array of differences that makes us all unique, uh, makes me different from you, um, but also the characteristics and identity such as gender and orientation, race, religion, age, and ability, just to name a few, there are many. Um, people often think about race alone because race is really easy to see and it's easy to categorize and chart, but there's much more to diversity than just race. So South Florida is unique in that we have a huge Hispanic population. So our diversity here in Miami looks different than maybe the rest of the country. Um, but that doesn't even begin to shed light on the differences between those countries of origin like Cuba, Venezuela, Peru, Colombia, they're all different and unique. And in religion, we have a really large Jewish population, but there's also a lot of people who are non-religious or maybe Christian, Buddhism. Each religion has beliefs and traditions to be respected. And then there's also, it's also important to support our LGBTQ community. Um, diversity is, a broad range of things. And in our growing knowledge of abilities and in mental awareness, there's a whole range of neurodiversity that we need to acknowledge and take into account when we're designing spaces as well. And although we categorize based on these broad buckets like race, orientation, religion, whatever it may be, I think it's important to understand that there's humanity within each of us. Um, that these categories don't necessarily define who we are, but there's so much more to each person than these buckets that we may put them in. And there's challenges and there's opportunity and beauty within all of that. So the challenge and the call to action here, I think for all of us is to get to know people who are different and surround yourself with people who are different from you to get to know their story and get to know their challenges. Because having empathy for people who are different is something that we need and that we need to be intentional about. Um, we talk a lot on a broader scale about the industry and what the industry and our companies can do to support JEDI, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion, but it's also at the micro level and in the control and responsibility of each person. Because if we don't each truly care about the humanity within each of us, then none of the rest of these JEDI principles will matter. Each of us has to care, care about one another, um, and it starts with diversity and caring to acknowledge the array of differences um, so that we can learn more about each other and work together for our advantage. So I like to preach that we need to care about and see it as an advantage in our lives. But like it or not, diversity is here to stay and diverse populations will continue to grow. And this data was taken from Census Bureau documentation. Underrepresented populations will hit majority status in the US by 2044. 
there will be a rebalance of what is considered majority and minority. And the white population is projected to shrink in the coming years. And this is due to a decrease in both birth rates, but also an aging baby boomer population. And the fastest growing racial or ethnic group will be biracial, which is increasing um, due to high birth rates, given that it's a relatively young age structure of that population group. So interracial marriage only became legal in 1967. That's pretty recent. So when you think about the recent implications of the legal mixing of races, you can see that this biracial mixed group is relatively new and part of the reason why it's the fastest growing. Um, there's also a, going to be a growth in foreign born population as immigration continues to diversify around us. And then we all know that Miami looks very different than many other US cities. We have about a 66% Hispanic population and the projected growth can be found in the black population, but also Asian populations in Miami. And we see these shifts happening as a society and how we categorize and think about diversity and minority and majority groups will continue to evolve over time. But however you look at it, I think understanding diversity and it's really becoming increasingly important to our workplaces and our society. And to have a common ground, a common understanding and belief that these are positive things is so important. Diversity is an advantage. So as architects and designers, we're building for a diverse world and we have the opportunity to harness this diversity and this growth because there's a greater collective knowledge and experience um, that we can gain in order to serve our clients and the industry and the built environment. So we see the projected growth of diversity and that's really eye-opening, but it's also eye-opening to note that within architecture, we're still lagging behind the predominant culture. And looking at this diversity and reviewing it isn't necessarily a new concept in architecture because the profession has been talking about it for a while now. And it's generally understood that there is and underrepresentation of women and people of color in architecture. In 2015, industry members, um, industry member organizations worked together to create a study examining what architects believe is causing this underrepresentation and what could be done to address it. So the result was the study called Diversity in the Profession of Architecture, and that's available on the AIA website. Um, but this survey gives really interesting data and graphs um, that examine the impact of demographics on the success of the field. And this is one of the charts from the survey, and it shows just the well-known fact that underrepresentation is present and our profession sees it and we are very aware. And this is another interesting graphic from Equity by Design. I think one or two other people are, showed this as well, but just to reiterate, it breaks down the demographics by male, female, and race. And it shows various stages of licensure, family, um, and position within a firm. And it's interesting to see the lack of racial diversity across the board, but strong female presence relatively. Um, and it's important to note how women and people of color slowly filter out in the higher firm positions. The principal category is largely white male, while designers and architects are a good mix of both. And the racial diversity throughout is low, but even lower towards those higher firm principal or those firm positions like principal. And I'm sure there are many factors causing this, but let's start by focusing on why diversity is such a positive thing for a company at all levels and how we can encourage diversity throughout an organization. So when we speak about diversity, I think it's important um, to note 
that when we speak about this, we often speak about the fact that diverse teams are known to be more productive and creative and innovative. And we understand that diversity is important to today's youth and a critical component in attraction and retention of staff. Uh, because they see diversity as offering greater opportunity for, per, for professional, but also personal growth. And this is also um, important to note on this slide that there is a large business case for diversity and that really affects leadership and decision makers within our firms. So this data here was taken from a McKinsey study that looked at over 1,000 companies covering 12 different countries. So they found that there was definitely a correlation between a diverse leadership team and financial outperformance. And that companies with higher gender diversity on executive teams were 21% more likely to outperform on profitability. And companies with high ethnic and cultural diversity on executive teams were 33% more likely to outperform on profitability. And then in the inverse, companies in the bottom quartile for both gender and ethnic cultural diversity um, were 29% less likely to achieve above average profitability. So there's definitely a business case showing business and performance related to diversity and adversely low success where there is not gender and ethnic culture diversity. And although statistics show that diverse teams lead to better business, I think it's critical to note that this is not a simple diversify and stir approach. It does take intentionality and in creating a Jedi accepting culture for this business case to work. So we know that diversity is growing. And so how do we successfully utilize this diversity within our firms and our industry to gain an advantage? And that takes us to the important Harvard review business case for diversity. So this study was created in response to the previous statistics on diversity improving businesses. And the argument here isn't that it's are untrue. Um, it's arguing that diversity, that increasing diversity by itself does not increase effectiveness. So along with diversity, there also needs to be really purposeful efforts by the company. So the purposeful efforts need to be made by a company for that business case to work. Um, and one of those is embracing a culture of learning and innovation, creativity and flexibility, equity and human dignity. And that's just having an overall positive culture and overall human focused way about going, going about business. Um, it's also important to harness diversity and recognize that there's a benefit to having a variety of voices in the room, a variety of perspectives, but also reshaping power structures and giving power to people to help set the agenda and influence what and how work is done. Um, also really important to reject the sole notion of financial gain and return on investment. Because when a company cares about money alone, that means they're not caring about the culture and they're not caring about the people. So it's important to reject the sole notion of the financial gain. Um, but then also critical to recognize and reward people opportunities to contribute and to advance. And Along with the culture and the firm, it's so important that leadership creates trust and listens to their people. Um, you know, having access to leadership, having an open door policy, that creates trust and that creates a positive culture. But also dismantling systems of discrimination and subordination. And that takes a hard look at a company and how this company may be acting. Um, but also, important for leadership to approach diversity proactively. And that is addressing it not only in reaction to crisis, because 
really limits people's capacity to learn. So having a proactive approach to diversity is so important um, for people to see and for diversity to matter within a firm. So there is a business case for diversity. And the statistics from the previous slide are still true, but they go hand in hand with creating a culture and leadership that supports and empowers diverse members. So what else can firms do to support diversity within the firm? Um, and these are broken down into three different categories. So the first one is leadership development and studio culture. And the first bullet point there is EDI training resources and committee. So EDI training is something that I think is so important for a firm of any size. And there are a lot of different consulting companies who offer diversity awareness and training. But it gives people a baseline understanding of what JEDI is, what diversity is, and how individuals can be more empathetic and understanding to others who may be different. So my company, OFS, we implemented a mandatory DEI training for all of our sales and marketing staff. And this was something that our DEI committee and our leadership um, brought about and agreed upon and our leadership wanted to invest in our people. So I talked to a lot of different people before this all took place. And I will say that there were individuals that were hesitant about this training. They weren't really sure what it would look like um, and what it would consist of. And there was a little bit of fear there, I think, that they would be judged or made to feel guilty in some way. But that really wasn't the case when it came to our DEI training. Um, in reality, what it provided was an awareness and it really opened people's eyes to have more understanding and compassion for their team and for a diverse workforce. So overall, I think we had really great feedback and many people responded that they valued OFS even more for investing in this training and that it made them really proud to work there. So I think that's a big one when it comes to culture. And I think a lot of us are on this call because we're interested and we care about diversity, but there are, are still a lot of people who don't understand or don't think it's important. So for firms who are able or interested, firm-wide training sessions are a great place to start just to get a baseline understanding and vision for why JEDI is so important for us and important to have a professional who is part of that. And we talked a lot about culture in the last slide and culture of accepting diversity. And sometimes people need that extra push in a training to have that awareness and to have that shift of thought, which truly changes a company culture. Um, another way is by creating committees or small forums to strategically discuss DEI, kind of like the AIA committee that several of us are on. Um, but also in my role at OFS, um, I co-chair our DEI committee and there are about 10 of us who meet every month or every other month. So the idea for the committee came from our leadership and it came from leadership and senior HR. And the committee alongside of our leadership was able to gather survey data on DEI efforts because it's important to have that data to track progress over time. And the committee implemented the training and we trained over 120 people on our sales and marketing teams. And another thing we did was to create an anonymous hotline um, for DEI suggestions or complaints so that everyone could have a part and have a voice. And we're working towards several other initiatives um, like support, inform, uh, support information and just looking at our internal practices. But the intent of these committees is to create a safe space for discussion among employees. And it's about listening to a company's people and creating the best company possible because I think that's who we all want to work for is the best, the best possible company. And 
in my case, because we had support of HR and support of leadership, we had access to be able to implement and act. And because the idea of this committee came from people above me and came from leadership, for me as an employee and as a person, it made me feel valued and cared for um, that, the, that the company took those efforts to form the committee. But it made me as an employee even more dedicated to the company and dedicated to who they were just because they invested that in us. And so for everyone on the call, I encourage you to start these discussions with your own, within your own circles, within your own firms, um, or groups just with the aim of improving firms and improving cultures. Um, it's also a great way would be through engaging allied organizations. There's resources like NOMA and Women in Architecture Committees and various organizations and resources. And again, leadership taking a vested interest in visible and vocal action is so important to supporting diversity. And it's important from the top down for leadership. And we talk a lot about leadership, but it's also important from the bottom up and for staff and young architects to share that and to show leadership that they care about diversity and that they want to see diversity within the firm. So the second bullet point here is outreach and career development. So there are amazing architecture pipeline programs starting. Um, and of course, BAM, Black Architects in the Making. And IIDA, which I'm a part of, um, has a new pipeline program called Design Your World. And there's always room for people to get involved in these sorts of things and always room for more scholarships and more support and more mentors for young people. Um, it's important that we have leadership training that continues from the junior designers all the way up through people's career because mentorship is so important to create that equity. Um, the third bullet point here, what can firms do to support diversity is through marketing and branding. And in this, having an EDI lens on all our communications is something that's critical and something that's sometimes an afterthought, but it's it's very important to those viewing our firms and within our firms. I was recently the guest judge for an annual design award in Texas for IIDA. And I reviewed over 100 project submissions for their awards gala. And it was really eye-opening as a judge to see all these projects. And some of them directly mentioned designing for diversity yet there was zero diversity in the people photographed within these project images. And it really struck me in looking at these beautiful projects that people had spent hours and days and you know, years working on, but yet they missed the mark in connecting their concept of inclusion to their final photographs, which neglected to show the diversity that they were designing for. So the importance of showing diversity spans into our renderings, our marketing pieces, project submissions and interviews. So for me as a person of color, seeing these things, I think to myself, is this a welcoming representation of this firm? And is this a project or a company that would welcome me with open arms? And these messages that we send as firms matter to those inside of our firms, but also those viewing from the outside. If we want to support and encourage diversity, we need to apply this lens of JEDI to everything that we do. So in part one, um, Vanessa spoke about several barriers to entry. Um, that limited diversity um, and barriers to entry of why these statistics are so low. And I just wanna focus on a few that continue to cause a chronic problem with the low rates of diversity in the profession. Um, and again, you're welcome to go and check out her talk um, on the AIA YouTube channel. Um, but a big one is access and representation. 
So access includes access to knowledge of the profession and awareness through schools and arts programs, um, which are being stripped away from our schools due to funding. But access is also having the ability to have role models who look like us. Um, we often say, if I can see it, I can be it. And that goes for representation because having someone who looks like you or believes like you do can help to pave a path for you and creates less resistance um, and an easier road. And if any of you watched the Olympics a couple weeks ago, um, I love the Olympics. It's the best athletes in the world all joining together. Um, but the cool thing was um, if you watch the swimming races, the swimmers would swim close to the lane marker of their opponent in front of them. And they would draft off the tails to conserve energy and to reduce strain. And it gave them an extra edge and propelled them along behind the person in front of them. And representation is so similar to that because sometimes it takes people to go in front and that is in stepping into a profession or in being the diversity of the firm or maybe the diversity of the leadership within the firm. It takes that to give someone else an extra edge and an extra um, ability to propel forward. So representation is so important um, when speaking of diversity and how to overcome the lack of diversity. And if you're on this call and you're a minor minority, I empower you to be a pioneer and to be a leader in every way that you possibly can. And for all of us, I encourage you to find someone who you can help to lend a hand to, um, because there's people who may need an extra push or that extra draft to start or advance in their career. And the second one is money. Money is of course a prohibitive barrier for some. There's a high cost of school and supplies and printing. And postgraduate salaries in architecture can be significantly less than similar degrees in maybe computer science or engineering or law. So let's make sure that we are asking for appropriate wages and that employers are paying people what they deserve and that we're not contributing to the wage gap of women and minorities. So not all of us are in a position to hire or make leadership decisions, but for those who are, or those who are looking to maybe hold your firm accountable, these are just a few things to think about when it comes to making an assessment of your firm's diversity hiring. And being aware of these things might help you to recognize various patterns, um, to evaluate how you operate and maybe where you're losing out on diverse thought or diverse input. And is there implicit bias, which is creating limitations and maybe how can you cast a broader net? So these are just some questions to assess. Um, the first one is representation and comparing the employees from specific identity groups to the overall labor market or industry benchmarks. And then retention, comparing the average tenure of employees from specific groups to the average tenure of um, other employees in the dominant group and recruitment. How many applicants from target groups are applying to your company versus the overall labor market? And the same goes for advancement, selection, and promotion. Just assessing certain groups against the total to see how you stack up and where there may be differences. So these are just some questions to provoke thought. And it's a really nice checkup to see if there may be bias or if there maybe needs to be some further reflection on why there's not representation or diversity or applicants seeking a firm. So are you creating a culture and leadership that is designed to empower a diverse workforce? And I think once you've assessed these things um, and really reflected on your own company and your history, 
how can we improve hiring practices ourselves? Or how can we suggest that our companies improve hiring practices? Um, how can we recruit for diversity? And two methods. Um, the first method is to just weed out bias. And bias is something that we all have, and we're all drawn to specific individuals who are like us. So we have to create structures to make hiring an objective process. So weeding out bias, um, it's important to create standardized processes for all applicants. Oftentimes we pride ourselves in the industry on hiring through word of mouth and hiring people who fit our perceived culture. But is that method limiting the diversity of thought and experience if we're only hiring friends of friends? And it's important to use neutral language in job descriptions um, and avoid job descriptions with nice to haves. Um, there's statistics that men apply for jobs where they only meet 60% of the job description, but women on the other hand, only apply if they meet 100% of the job description. So just knowing some of these things can change how we write these job descriptions to minimize some less important criteria. Also important to have structured interviews and scorecards just so it's more objective. Um, and then important to review our recruitment pipelines um, and look who we're using to recruit. Are we using headhunters or job boards that understand and support diversity? Um, of course, in a famous study from years back on applicant callbacks between two people with the exact same resume qualifications, the person with the Caucasian sounding name was 50% more likely to receive a callback than a person with a black sounding name. And that's a famous study, um, but Things like this, this bias, um, that can make their way into our hiring processes. So we need to know and we need to be cognizant of that so that we can pinpoint the bias and help weed it out. Um, and the second method would be just to correct for bias. So when we recognize that a change and diversity is needed, we have to target maybe specific groups to help improve our overall diversity. And I don't think anyone is an advocate of advancing someone who is unqualified, but there are plenty of qualified applicants if we look in the right places and maybe change what we're doing and do our own part to create a just and inclusive environment. Um, so, create specific diversity targets. You know, let's look in the right places. Um, there are a lot of resources. I think Craig talked about some ways last week um, about how to hire for diversity. And also one method would be to hire multiple people for a role at a time, get multiple people started um, to create that comfort, that inclusion. But then also, post jobs to targeted platforms for targeted outreach. Um, a lot of ways that we can correct for bias um, and also weed out bias. So in wrapping this up, um, diversity in our world, it's growing. Um, and likewise, it also needs to grow in our industry of architecture. And we've talked about the benefits of diversity and how leadership and company culture play such a huge role in creating an atmosphere that embraces diversity as a positive asset. And we've looked at ways um, that we can reflect on our own firms and our own hiring processes to evaluate and improve our diversity. And we as an architectural community, we design and we build for a diverse world and a growing diverse world. And it's critical that our own tables and our own studios work toward reflecting the communities and the people that we serve. Thank you. Does anyone have questions? 
That's just what I was going to ask. If you have questions, if you would like, you can turn on your cameras, or if you want, you can put them in the uh, chat. And Maria will. Let's see. Let's see. Leslie was talking about she found an article on WGBH. What the new census data shows about race depends on how you look at it. Anyhow, Nadine says excellent. Uh, any other questions or any discussion on this? Well, I guess not. Um, and so we will be. Um, I, I think Leslie has a question. Oh. No, I was just going to comment on this article, which is saying over time, it's less clear about what race people fall into because of people can be of so many different races at this point. And when people start doing their DNA and they find out, you know, they all come from Africa, then, <laughs> you know, the whole thing is kind of... Uh, so it's less important than systemic racism and what we can do to make improvements is, is more important than worrying about what category each person fits in. Does that make sense? At least that's my interpretation of this. I think it's definitely growing and changing. Um, I think as we move forward, there's definitely going to be a shift in more of those biracial people like we talked about. So I think when you talk about systemic racism- They were talking about, yeah. Yeah, when you talk about systemic racism, um, I think when you're, I'm biracial, I'm half um, black, half Filipino. So, it still affects me in those parts that are, you know, that black portion. So I think we're going to still have a wide variety of people who care about these topics, um, who care about the history within our country and what we're doing to overcome these things and to make ourselves better. So that's a good point there. Um, well, next week we're at um, uh, six o'clock. We're gonna have the uh, final part of this series um on the jedi principles jedi principles and nadine st louis uh will be um talking about inclusion so if everybody wants to join us um next week at 6 p.m um the same link that you use to join this uh particular um webinar is the one you can use for next week too so thank you maria really great job appreciate it any final comments for us, Maria? Thank you all. And be sure to tune in next week for our final presentation to wrap it up. And don't forget, if you missed any, they are all available to watch again on YouTube. So please share the word, share the links. Um, we just want to get the, the message out there. I'll be sending everyone an email tomorrow with the uh, link to the recording and also to a short survey. Uh, we're constantly trying to improve our programming and uh, these, this is like a two minute thing. It's very simple. And uh, if you could help us out by filling out the survey, that'd be helpful too. So we'll see you all next week. Thank you.